Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 484. I'm Kevin Golson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Tuesday, February the 5th, 2019. <laughs> Okay, guys, welcome to the program. To the audience, welcome to the program. We're actually recording kind of late in the afternoon here. Uh, it is on the East Coast, 3.13. And if you do the math, what are you, five or six hours? What's what's the time over there, Gavin? It's, it's quarter past eight. And you've had your supper. You're all set. You're uh, no, been... no. <laughs> <laughs> so this show is going to be about three old people trying to give you the news without taking their afternoon naps. And you gonna have to put up with that. However, before we get any further, I need you guys to like the show. And you know how to do that by now. Subscribe to the show if you've not subscribed. Comment if you have not commented. And share if you've not shared. Gentlemen, how you been doing this week? Well, Gavin's been on his bike to all sorts of exciting places. You were in Chichester this, this morning. Yes. And the last few days. Yeah. Yes, uh, there was a conference down there to see what the next stage of rehabilitating George Bell ought to be and to pressurize the Bishop of Chichester to rename a house he received as a gift from some nuns uh, and to give it back George Bell's name. So I was one of the speakers at the conference. The Bishop of Chichester came and addressed the conference, which made for some extremely interesting social dynamics. And a great, great time was had by all. But Gavin, I think our viewers want to know, did you take your motorcycle in the it's winter? Right. Or did you take <laughs> how did you get there? I mean, are, how brave is Gavin Ashenden? Is he well, cross country on his cycle? Uh, seeing uh, absolutely, I, dro I drove my car and uh, and um, was 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 very glad. I mean, dri driving four hours in Great Britain is a is a mammoth trek. It's almost equivalent to driving from the east to the west coast in your terms <laughs> now uh, florida or the united yes, states right. well now george you have a football injury this week uh well <laughs> yes i have uh i have either torn or damaged my hamstring so i have uh where well, I had a cane. Where did it go? I have. <laughs> oh, here it is. I've got my cane. Uh -huh. I've got ace bandages, and I'll find out within a few days whether I need surgery or not. It's lovely. It's all shades of the rainbow colors, purple and red and blue. And Ooh. gosh, I sound like a bishop at a diocesan convention. Wait, all, now you have the shepherd's all the shades all set. of God's creation. Now I am helping Michaela, my middle daughter, move to Pittsburgh this week. She's uh, took a job out there and. That'll be a lot of fun, saying a goodbye to Kevin, another. Kevin, I, I've got some muscle relaxing pills. Yes, and I'll need it. <laughs> Moving a daughter across the United States, I think, requires both muscle relaxants and painkillers and opioids. Any that you can get would be helpful. She has a accumulated a lot of stuff in the uh, two years she moved out of our house. So uh, it is what it is. We'll probably take the good 28-foot moving truck. You know how it works. Uh, uh, where do you put the dog? In the car with you or in the truck? Uh, the, she has a car. I have the truck. She can drive the car with the stinky dog. So that's how that's going to work. Um, but before we change, we're probably driving people crazy here. Uh, we sat in the wrong seats. I'm going to go and change these over so people aren't just freaking out. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so we got a lot of news today. I wanted to get into the your... Uh, meeting you went to on George Bell, because what we've seen so far with the Church of England is they will not defend um, innocent until proven guilty. And if they won't do it for George Bell, who are they going to do it for? Um, tell me a little bit about your conference, Gavin. In Chichester, there is a, a rather nice house. The Archdeacon used to live in it. It was owned by some nuns, I think the Sisters of the Holy Cross, uh, and they gave the house to the diocese. And they gave it, and it was worth a great deal of money. Uh, and they gave some money as well. And they specifically said, we'd like this to be in honor of George Bell. So it was named George Bell House. Uh, and the very first thing that the cathedral authorities did when the story broke, it was introduced to me with a motion when I was on the chapter saying, we're now going to rename the house Cannon Lane and, and ditch it. Um, and uh, does anyone have any comments? And, and I said, knowing very little about it then, but 
causing a certain amount of trouble, I'm afraid. I said, well, if you're going to rename it, you must have a decent name. I suggest you call it Natural Justice House in, in honor of what you're denying George Bell. Anyway, that didn't go down very well. No Meanwhile, se several years later, the, 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 the interesting thing that happened today was the, the Bishop of Chichester came to address this group it was a very eminent group. It had some some diplomats, some headmasters, a man who was chair of the Diocesan Board of Finance, really the stalwarts who are the rock upon which the cathedral and the diocese were founded. And they they turned out because they are so energized and cross about what's happened to George Bell's reputation. And we heard stories about the way in which the 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 guide, the cathedral guides were under the three line whip to tell anybody who asked as many of the unpleasant facts about George Bell as they could muster. And many of the guides said, look, we're not here to re-tell uh, history in these terms. And, and those guides who objected were fired and they were sent away. So the, the Bishop of Chichester, who's not the most popular person for this group, uh, turned up to have coffee and said he'd like to give a short address. And everyone said, well, this is very courteous and very nice of him very pastoral. So he then stood up and uh, he, he then, it became clear what he'd come to do. He came to profusely apologize and everyone saw you and they were very impressed. But it turned out after five minutes that what he was doing was apologizing for bad process and nothing else. And then since he knew we'd come to ask him to present a petition saying, please change the name of the house back because Bell is innocent. He said he wasn't going to do it. Partly, he said, because he didn't really have the power. Um, technically, he doesn't, but he certainly has the influence. But, but mainly, he said, because this little house earned a great deal of money. It was a bijou, a sort of Airbnb. Uh, and it, it, it produced really quite a sizable amount of money for the cathedral, money which they were very happy to plough into causes that were dear to George Bell's heart, like their education centre and their bookshop and very, very valuable things. And George Bell would be jolly happy to know this money was being used and they weren't going to rename it. Now, now, Gavin, let, just so I understand you clearly, uh, they're very happy to plough this into children's education and whatnot <laughs> in George Bell's name. And But wasn't George Bell accused with fiddling with small children? What, would, what are they telling us here that uh, it's more important? I'm not entirely sure that the Bishop of Chichester had joined all the dots up in his little presentation. But in fact, um, this sedate group of bourgeois, restrained, stiff upper lip, cold blooded English men and women suddenly turned really rather seriously r r rabid upon him. And they, they began to catcall and heckle him and shout him down, saying, This is not good enough. How dare you come here and say these things? And then I'm afraid. Uh, I, I also made an intervention because um, the, 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 it's not just about George Bell. Of course, it is, but not many people know who he is. There's a much more important principle here. Um, just as our culture is beginning to turn, turn rotten, and just at the point where people are being found guilty simply by virtue of identity politics, just at the point where our society is coming apart at the stream, the, the, the seams, this principle of innocent until proved guilty is more and more valuable. And the, the fact is, it only disappears when you enter into a totalitarian phase of some kind. You know, the, 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 the Politburo in the Soviet times would, would declare you guilty and you'd have to prove yourself innocent of thought crime. The same thing was true in fascist Germany. It, it, it's one of the bellwether elements that tell you whether or not you're living in a just democracy with the rule of law, or in some kind of mob violence place driven by arbitrary forces. So it really matters a great deal. Yeah, Gavin, um, Gavin oh. I, I need to jump in because this is not an English problem. This is a universal problem in Western culture. You would not have seen this, Gavin, but at the Super Bowl, the Washington Post newspaper uh, had a, an ad on the uh, Super Bowl broadcast football game I think one most watched television show of the year for most. I think. Not not this year, but most years, yes. Most years, where it basically lauded itself for its bravery in speaking truth to power and how it was standing up for truth and righteousness and mm. freedom. Now, when you describe the uh, 
guilty until proven innocent. This is the Washington Post approach to those Covington Catholic school boys. Well, yeah. well let me give you a quick example of the Washington Post. The Washington Post had a rumor, not even a story, about somebody who had accused, uh, at that time, Judge Kavanaugh of some inappropriateness at a party when high school, and she had written a little deposition, sent it in, just a rumor. They didn't have anything else. No <clears throat> pictures, no no statements, no uh, whatever you need. They had last week signed statements, confessions from both people uh, to a sexual crime and never printed it. The person they had that on was the lieutenant governor of Virginia hmm. who has admitted to having a, he calls it consensual, she calls it rape, uh, sexual liaison. And uh, Washington Post never ran it. That's not important. We just didn't, we didn't feel we had enough evidence. That's the Washington Post. But I think where Gavin is going, and I totally agree, it's it's the state, Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. uh, Stalinist Russia, Communist Russia was the state. But it's moved past the state now, I think, in England and America, to the elites, be it the yeah. media. And to the press. Corporations, uh, corporations, mm. major multinational corporations, are some of the most PC environments you'll ever find. The church, institutional church. Uh, I had to suffer through a diocesan address this past weekend where we were lauded to having more more clergy of a certain gender and of a certain race. These were our great uh, accomplishments. Not that these were fantastic clergy bringing people to Jesus Christ, many of them are, but rather just by ticking off boxes uh, you know, we, we've accomplished a moral good. Uh, but it's this, this, ah, oh, it's just dreadful. Uh, well, the, the Bell case has, has come to a very interesting stage of development because it, it um, things are clarifying, the fog is lifting. So a man called Lord Carlyle, who was asked to look into the original complaint, uh, wrote a report saying that the way you've handled this has been absolutely atrocious. But his hands have been tied by the terms of reference, cl cleverly by the church. And he wasn't able to pronounce about the cogency of the elderly lady's 70-year-old memories. But he introduced some psychiatric evidence uh, along the way saying you cannot rely on memories over that period of time, good ones or bad ones. Now, once he'd, covered, once he'd published his report, um, the next thing that happened was that instead of apologizing, the Church of England said, wait, we've got some new information and we've given it to the police. And everyone said, oh. This is terrible. This must be really serious, cogent information. You you really are suggesting that this is corroborative material that shows you were right in the first place. Well, no one can say anything. F fortunately, after a while, they commissioned a man called uh, Bryden to write a report on this extra evidence. And everyone was waiting to see whether or not it was serious stuff that proved the original complainant had corroborative material or whether it wasn't. Bryden looked at it and it was... Um, entirely without any substance. That's the polite way of saying it. It was my understanding that this was more of a ghost story because the allegations occurred seven or ten years after the death of <laughs> yes. George Bell. That it was George Bell's, uh, it was the ghost of George Bell who engaged in sodomy on the hood of a Rolls Royce in the Episcopal Palace garage. Well, and um, indeed, indeed, that's right. And there was another another woman who gave evidence saying uh, that, that he interfered with her crotch. And when she was cross-examined, he said, well, it might have been my tummy. Well, I, you know, what's the difference, she said. Uh, <laughs> so so her, her, her evidence was discounted, <laughs> too. Uh, then there was a psychiat there was a psychiatric nurse who, who said that she'd heard hearsay upon hearsay. Uh, and when the journalist and the psychiatric nurse who had reported these things were looked for, they had disappeared completely. So Bryden said, um, there was never anything in this corroborative material. Now, what that meant was that the safeguarding culture of the Church of England had deliberately used it to put the hounds off the scent, to buy themselves some more time. So um, finally, the Archbishop and Martin Warner have apologized. And their technique is, is the classic non-apology. So, George, if, if I was to upset you a great deal and I didn't, and I, I wanted to make a show of apology, then the, the classic non-apology is to say, hey, George, I'm really sorry that you feel so hurt and wounded by what I said. You, you, know, you poor thing, I, I weep for you. 
<laughs> well, I, I do want to. I weep for you. Want, said the walrus. I weep for you. <laughs> I, I want to ask a question about this because here in America, there's laws. You can't false imprison anybody. You'll be paying a lot of money. Uh, false accusations, slander, libel uh, can all get you in trouble. Would any of this fall under that type of preview of uh, legal jeopardy in the Church of England or in England? No, I don't think you can defame a dead person. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, p part of the problem is that it isn't just George Bell. It's happened to a number of important uh, figures, live and dead. Cliff Richard, you may remember, mm -hmm. was accused in exactly the same way. And they did what they did to George Bell as well. They, 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 they made it as public as possible to see if they could get some, they could jog the public's memory to, to bring more allegations. This happened to Lord Branwell, a very senior um, uh, army officer. It happened to poor old Edward Heath, against whom there was no evidence. I mean, I, I, Edward Heath used to moor his yacht in the parish that I was vicar of in Jersey. And everyone there, the point about these yachts were th th there were no rooms in them. They were, they were, they were in, everyone could see everything. You had trouble going to the lavatory in any kind of privacy. Even that wasn't possible. And yet the allegations were, that, of course, that he'd had wild sex parties with underage children and it, th there was no evidence and it wasn't true. Now, the important thing when, when allegations are brought is that the truth must be the test everyone uses. And in this particular case, when Martin Warner came and began to apologize profusely about the process, yes, we got the process wrong. He studiously refused to say anything about Bell. But Lord Carlyle, no longer shackled by terms of reference, has called upon the Church of England categorically to declare George Bell completely innocent. And you couldn't be more clear than Lord Carlyle, who, of course, saw all the evidence in the first report. So when Martin Warner was asked why he couldn't do that, he simply refused. Now, uh, Professor Chandler, who was George Bell's biographer, has written some very pungent things saying these guys are too proud and too um, too self-interested to, to tell the truth. But, but of course, there's another analysis, too, and that is that they've deliberately sought public sympathy uh, by showing how ruthlessly they're pursuing a safeguarding case to make up for all the other lapses of judgment and lapses of responsibility that sadly the church is engaged in. But you can't, just because George Bell is dead, you can't sacrifice his reputation to cover up your own incompetence. So it's either Chandler's analysis or, or the second one. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, one of the newspapers is, is interested in this and looks like it's going to be carrying quite an explosive story, calling upon both the Archbishop of Canterbury and Martin Warner to get their act together to recover some sense of integrity and historical perspective and ethical uh, uh, ethical good practice and declare Bell innocent. I don't think they will, but it will at least it will bring the matter more clearly into the public focus so people to make a choice and to decide where, even if the Washington Post can't do it and the BBC can't do it, uh, can the Church of England put truth before self-interest? I'm, I'm not optimistic because, and it's not just the Church of England, uh, it's the institutional elites, and, you, and the Church of England I include in that. Mm. I read a little news snippet that the chief constable who basically blew the Rotherham investigations of uh, uh, grooming and gang, and raping, uh, uh, grooming and raping young girls by, by uh, what they call Asian gangs in these industrial British gritty, gritty cities, uh, she blew it. She did. I mean, she ignored it. She co she covered it up. She had nothing to uh, do with do with bringing anyone to justice. Guess who's been appointed the new head of the anti trafficking task force? Mm. This this uh, this police this policeman. Uh, mm. When the police raided Cliff Richard's home, who did they tell before the raid? Did they ask Cliff Richard and his attorney to come in for a chat? No, they told the BBC. And as the police are coming with helicopters overhead to Cliff Richards' mansion in the in the countryside, it's all being filmed for television. Mm. It's I don't want to get too deep into American politics, but it's what we see. Uh, you have a 66-year-old man uh, who is being charged with civil crimes, having 20 was it 26 or 29 heavily armed FBI agents descend on his house 
with uh, with CNN and accompanying them. Um, this is this is such this is evil, and it's a, it's an across the board evil. We see this mm. mindset in the police, in the media, in the government, in corporations. It's well, that's know. crazy. I mean, America deserves better politics, and we currently deserve better journalism. Journalism has really suffered. Um, we what we just uh, teased Washington Post, CBS. Uh, also won an award for their honest journalism and ran a commercial during the Super Bowl as well. Um, they had Dan Rather, who kind of started this whole fake news thing. No, I guess it was NBC. Fake but, but true. Fake but true. Fake but true. It was the right. <laughs> it was his motives were pure. He just happened to be making up the story. So and then was, tw- <laughs> twenty years ago, NBC was doing a kind of a, a mortar trend thing about most dangerous cars. And uh, they tipped a car over, and it didn't explode, so they went and got another car, tipped it over, and put flares on the bottom so it would explode and make for a better production for their news coverage. Um, we can't make fake news here because it, the real stuff is just too interesting. Let's. Yeah, yeah, the, I want to uh, push back, push you out a tiny bit. Sure. You've had this meeting. So what? What happens now? Where does oh. it go next? What are you going to do? I mean, how are you? What? How can these injustices, uh, most people don't care about or even know George Bell, but they recognize injustice. How can these injustices be put right? I think there are only two things you can do, and both of them have, have limited. I mean, a number of people afterwards said, well, all right, Gavin, you've left the Church of England for the protest. We, we, we kind of see why. Well, is there any way in which we can hold the diocese, the archbishop, to account? And I said, well, the only by withholding your money. And one elderly man said, I was going to leave 50,000 pounds to the cathedral. I'm 89. I'm going to go off any minute now, but they're not getting a penny of my money anymore. Um, and my dress, Gavin, give me my dress. <laughs> right. Yes. I, George, I, I, did, I did say, Lord, send him to my website to see that I need my travel being paid. Um, but part, partly because uh, this whole enterprise is being run by a man called Richard Simmons, who's, who's, who's profoundly deaf and disabled. And this small, determined man, full of integrity, is, is paying out of his own pocket for these events. There is no money doing it anywhere. So I hope he'll get some of this 50,000. But the answer is, the only thing you can do is withdraw your money and your presence. But even then, uh, the church as an institution will continue. My real concern, apart from all the things we've said, is we're entering, I think, a very dangerous point in history. I keep on finding myself drawn back to the parallels with with Berlin in 1931, 1932, a growing sense of of political um, hardness coming up to threaten democracy. It's not the Nazis this time, although your uh, anti-fascist people behave like brown shirts on American campuses, but, but freedom of speech freedom of thought and the presumption of innocence are disappearing. And the point is you can't do Christianity without those things. You have to be able to stand on street corners or be able to write emails telling people about Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. You have to be able to tell the truth about human behavior. And the moment you lose the presumption of innocence and freedom of speech, well, we're off back to the catacombs. And it's just extraordinary to me that the elite of the church are willing to side with this progressive clamp down that involves a threat to freedom of speech and the presumption of innocence. Well, in the I, I, I want to push back. You said you can't do Christianity in those situations. Christianity thrives in the persecuted uh, realm. Um, it always has. Um, it's more difficult uh, to perform Christianity and, and evangelize in those situations, but I look at China and other places, Vietnam, uh, where the church is growing in pretty much the same type of situation with no freedom of speech. Well, I, 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 Kevin, I, I want to push back on that historical analogy because it's not. No, funny. it's mine. It because Christianity was almost rooted out, root and branch in North Africa, in its traditional heartland by the Muslim invasion. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's good. One of the reasons why was that the churches were so separated over time. Yeah. Uh, in North Africa, for instance, you had a uh, Greco-Roman elite with Berber uh, worshipers, different ethnic groups, the elites and the people in the pews. And when Islam came along, uh, the church couldn't survive because 
it was so in inherently internally weak and divided, and in some cases outright corrupt. So yes, in China, yes, in the Sudan, yes, in the former Soviet Union. But uh, I, I would agree. No, it Korea, would be very but, difficult in North Korea. Mm, I, yeah. But where, but where, but where that faith is institutionally corrupted, I don't. I think persecution is successful. Yeah, I agree. Uh, if I look at history. So I mean, I take. I think you're both, you're both right. I, I don't mean to be self-serving, but if you said to me, uh, this is the argument I think about pre and post Constantine. A lot of people say that after Constantine, the church had it too good and it relaxed and so on. But but if you had to choose between seeing your children being sent to the lions because they refused to sacrifice to the emperor, or uh, or having your children instead sent to, to school and being part of a flourishing community, you know, there's no, there's no harm in spreading the gospel in a benign community. Um, of course, we must face persecution. Of course, the church uh, finds a way of flourishing, but we shouldn't look for it. We certainly shouldn't let our privileges go because we're too lazy and corrupt to defend them. Persecution works so long as the persecutors get hold their act together. Nazi Germany would never have collapsed under its internally were it not for the Stalin, the armies of Stalin and the British and American Air Forces. Yeah, pe people say, well, you know, this is very interesting. Bonhoeffer was so impressive because, you know, <clears throat> one of the things we're planning to do is to build a confessing fellowship, a confessing church in this country. And then I have to say to people, actually, Bonhoeffer failed, um, as you quite rightly say, with Stalin's tanks who exhausted Hitler with, in, in Leningrad. So there's, there's, there is a kind of romanticism about going underground and suffering. But I'm afraid... Uh, it's not a romanticism that I'm much attracted to. Gavin, uh, I, I want to push you on one little point. You mentioned withholding money, uh, something mm. that's been done in the United... Since the special convention of the Episcopal Church, I believe in 1968, people withheld money. And what has it gotten us? It got us Gene Robinson 30 years later. Uh, and 50 years later, it's given us Michael Curry and the current environment. Uh, if you withhold money from the Diocese of Chichester, mm -hmm. Chichester, the last person to be impacted is Martin Warner. Yes, His that's priority right. comes first. You shut down the canteen. You shut down the education programs. You, the bishop's car is uh, downgraded to, to a Vauxhall, or if they still make those from uh, <laughs> a Jaguar. Uh, my point being is there's no downside personally for Martin Warner or Justin Welby. No, are, but they, are they not... How can they be held to account for their actions and their injustices they have perpetrated? Uh, only in the public sphere, if there is enough integrity in in the nation, in uh, and in the church to to hold them to account. And if there isn't, they won't be. You're quite right. The church commissioners are immensely wealthy, and although there are severe restrictions which determine how they can spend their money. They, they they do and are supposed to spend it on the on the bishops and uh, on on all the accoutrements that keep them in place. So nothing will affect Martin, Warner and Welby uh, personally in terms of comfort. But I think it's quite important that they shouldn't be seen to be speaking on behalf of people they don't represent anymore. I I, I do think that that if you that, that if you love Jesus and you believe in the Bible and you uh, honor the traditions of the church there are some institutions that you would want to withdraw your support from as a matter of integrity this is a, a, a bit of a sidestep but what i find so appalling in all this is that there are still conservatives in the u.s and canada and australia and other places that look to justin welby to be their savior yeah they look at justin welby who well he's one of us he speaks alpha language he uh he, 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 we, we understand his DNA, therefore he really must appreciate the pressures we're being placed under by the General Convention, by uh, our fellow bishops. And they've put their trust in Justin Welby, and I just think... Well, I, I have had a big wake-up call, and my big w wake-up call was with Bishop Love. Mm. Um, if somebody had attacked Bishop Love five years ago, there would have been more response from the communion. Ten years ago, there would have been a lot of letters going back and forth, a lot of personal calls uh, from other primates. Uh, Twenty years ago, it, it couldn't Iraq have happened. Iraq would have been on the yeah. plane. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> they have it out with uh, Rowan Williams. But right now, there are no defenders within the Episcopal Church, within the communion partners, with anybody who thinks the Anglican communion is working. They're, here's the evidence it's not working. Uh, they're not defending Bishop Love. Nobody says, ooh, stop, you shouldn't do that. Nobody. And Kevin, uh, I have spoken of my deep respect and support for Bishop Love, and I actually feel he is in an outstandingly strong legal position. Uh, but nobody's defended uh, Sam Howard, the Bishop of Florida. That's Here's right. a communion partner's bishop. Here's somebody whom uh, the ACNA clergy in North Florida detest because that's they've split over him. Sam Howard has held the line on these issues. And the Episcopal News Service has published a series of articles basically trying to knock him over, to basically play up the small group of anti-Sam Howard uh, clergy left in the Diocese of Florida. And we've not seen any pushback for Sam Howard. Um, these guys, I don't know what they're thinking. Maybe they think that there's some... Uh, the Lone Ranger is not going to ride in off the plains and save save them from the bandits. Uh, nor nor will the Anglican Communion. Yeah. No. Yeah, the Anglican, well, the Church of England won't because they throw everybody un under the bus. Uh, I'm not seeing them defend anybody except Michael Curry. One of the things I'd like to say, I think, is sometimes people have, a, have complained to us that we bring too much bad news. But I think one of the ways in which, ultimately, this is a responsibility of the Holy Spirit. This is our Lord's church. It, it's his body. Uh, it's astonishing he's de delegated so much responsibility uh, to, to, to so many of us who are incompetent and, and flawed people. But it's his job to renew it and to defend it. I think one of the things that we ought to do and are doing is trying to tell as much of the truth as possible. Um, because only by telling the truth, I think, can the consciences be uh, awoken uh, and, and a distinction made between wheat and tares, between good behaviour and corrupt behaviour. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased that as part of our conversation, one thing we're trying to do is to awaken consciences, to allow the Holy Spirit to change people's minds and, and bring metanoia. There was, a, there was an exchange of articles uh, in Anglican Inc. Uh, recently between Stephen Knoll, uh, long-time vice-chancellor again to Christian University, Professor of Trinity Seminary, the author of the Jerusalem Declaration. Uh, mm. Stephen Knoll is a heavy hitter of heavy hitters with George Sumner, former dean of Wycliffe College in Toronto and now the Bishop of Dallas, where George Sumner and the communion partners have been under constant shellfire from the left. And now they're being engaged by people of the standing of Stephen Knoll, who are doing... In other words, yes, they've always been attacked by being sellouts and sort of calumnies, but they're being asked to defend the theology. I mean, what do you truly believe about koinonia? What do you truly believe about the ecclesiastical office that you hold? So for me, uh, my sympathies lie in both camps, but I'm encouraged to see that these conversations are starting and we're not just going to say, oh, well, Justin Welby will save us. Oh, well. He's an Episcopal, he's going to hell anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm. We, we're engaged in a struggle to find the truth. Mm. And now we could actually go the Francis route and say God wills that we have ACNA and Czech, and that God wills that half the world is Muslim and Buddhist. Yeah, you, you're referring to the article I read this morning, aren't you? <laughs> yes, Pro Francis and the Imam, uh, Sheikh to Wadri to Al Zara, the, the Grand Sheikh of Al Azhar and Cairo formed a joint, signed a joint declaration of on faith, where God wants us wants the Muslims to be Muslim and God wants the Christians to be, not even Catholic but Christians. <laughs> this is uh, actually raised some eyebrows in the Catholic traditional press. It's been a lot of fun mm -hmm. reading. That you know, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure. It just the news now is Pope Francis delivers his first papal mass on the Arabian Peninsula. So all that peace talk was worth it. He got to uh, do the Arabian Peninsula. They just started a church in Saudi Arabia uh, six months, four months ago. So uh, he's making inroads, but I think for the wrong reasons. Well, you know, I'm going to be a pill, Kevin. You know I love 
historical oddities and facts, Francis may not have been the first pope to celebrate. Oh, there good. were a number of Syrian popes, were? Yeah. priests from Syria, who <laughs> became pope in the 4th and 5th century. So, uh, whether oh. or not they celebrated before the smoke left, St. Peter's wasn't built, but before they celebrated, uh, this takes us back, you know, the church has had, the church is from that part of the world. Well, here's a new, another story just came out on Pope Francis. I got this feed going right in front of me. Pope Francis offers to mediate between Venezuelan leaders. He likes it to marriage counseling. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I wake up and I, I think of Justin Welby. Now, as, now, Kevin, we should not be mean to the Pope because oh, did not Justin Welby propose the Church of England? as being a model for mediation right. and peace and speech in Parliament? Uh, yes, he did, Kevin, absolutely. Am I not correct on that? <laughs> you are. One of the very strange things is that when he was asked by um, Charles Moore uh, whether or not he was comfortable with the fact that 10% of the serving Roman Catholic clergy in England are ex-Anglicans who fled the Church of England because of its heterodoxy, he threw up his hands and said, well, case sera, sera, if that's what they like to do, that's absolutely fine by me, without any sense at all. And this was taking place in Cranmer's study in Lambeth Palace, without, without any sense that, that truth claims matter very much indeed. I think one of the things that, that I see in the Pope Francis story is that um, it's very important that as, as Anglicans born in the Reformation, we don't allow too much of our furniture to be set permanently in a Reformation orientation. The fact is the church always needs to be reformed, the Anglican as well as the Catholic. And the Catholics are having their own very distinctive struggle between modernism and relativism on the one hand and the faith of our fathers and our mothers uh, on the other. So uh, in a strange kind of way, this is no longer reformed, good reformed people looking down their noses at bad old Tridentine Catholics. Um, Christian communities the world over are having to try to work out how the spirit of the age corrupts them and how they can keep faith with the apostolic church. And the, the Catholic church are having as much trouble over that as we are. Okay, we've really going to shoot high in this. We've gone from uh, George Bell stories. Now we're going all the way up to the top of Christendom. Yes. <laughs> we, have, we now have in the Catholic church, we in essence have two popes. We mm -hmm. actually have two popes. But we have two Catholicisms. Yes, this and Benedict in Orthodox, and, and, and neither one of them is complaint uh, is saying, "Hey, we're not changing the prayer book." <laughs> in Orthodoxy, we have the Russian Church versus the Ukraine in the Const Con Constantinople, and it's and the fight is now so denigrating that the Ukrainians are basically bringing out all the KGB archives they have to tar as many of the Moscow people as being former. Uh, KGB informers. Mm -hmm. And in the Anglican world, well, we've been divided for a good long time. We have the Welby world, and uh, and here's the darn thing. We don't have a friend. We don't have a Benedict. We don't have anyone who we can sort of push up and stand. Well, I see Rowan Williams do interviews every once in a while. Uh, yeah. I don't think Rowan is the man. <laughs> Well, well, I, I, I actually, I had a, on my four-hour journey, I, I bought the audible version of Rowan Williams's book on Saint Augustine, and uh, I, I, first of all, I liked it very, very. I once had a spiritual director, was the abbot of a monastery, who kept on wanting to read John of the Cross, and he'd written a lot about him, but John of the Cross was a great deal clearer than than. My, than the man who'd written about him. And the same was true with Rome, Williams, and Augustine. Every time he began to quote Augustine, he thought, oh, the sky is clearing now. I understand the words. <laughs> um, I think Rowan actually is a very profound Christian and theologian. Uh, but, but there were so many compartments to his mind, and some of them were quite progressive and left wing, uh, that, that interestingly enough, I'm not sure he exists in one composite personality, except when he was functioning as archbishop and saw his job to keep the church together, which some people thought uh, was was too pragmatic. We don't have a Benedict. I, I, I wish we did. But we do have voices being raised for the renewal of the church and calling it to a historic integrity. And so uh, I, hope, I hope they continue to be heard. Well, we have a Ben Quashi, and we have a uh, uh, Foley Beach. And uh, yes. I, I put much confidence in, in both of those men. Uh, you know, and we have a God above, and 
who really cares about this stuff. We call it inside baseball. Eh, to him, it's you know a little bit higher yeah, on, the, on the totem pole. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna rain in your parade a bit. I agree with you about the person and character of the two, Ben Quashi and Foley Beach, but they're not given the tools to get the job done. Not yet, no. They're not, not given the tools. They're not given the. You know, poor Foley Beach has basically his great grief right now are the Nigerians sending bishops without asking. Um, Border the, crossing. Gafcon needs to get its house in order. Hmm. And to do so, uh, then it can unleash men of the caliber of Ben Quash. Ben Quashi could be the Benedict, hmm. but he needs, he needs the money. They're not giving him the money to do it. He needs the instruments, the the media, the mechanics, the ability to travel, the ability. To, and what are they doing? They're starving him to death. So, if all these people, uh, you're, Gavin, your man with fifty thousand pounds to leave, well, send it, send it to me. Send it yes, to me. Yeah. Now, <laughs> speak to him in a dream. <laughs> but but the, what, what I'm going to say is that. The battle's not over. The battle's not lost. We have all the tools and weapons we need. We just need to get them organized and, mm. and armed and ready to fight the good fight. Mm, indeed. Okay. And we also have the issues. So, I mean, what's left? I want to congratulate all both of you guys for not falling asleep, for holding up in the afternoon and evening for Gavin there. Um, we've hit 42 minutes. That's a, that's a, that's a, a meaty meaty unscripted and people are going to love it and they're going to go on and share it and they're going to like it on Facebook and they're going to comment on it and they're going to say oh I haven't subscribed yet they're going to go to the YouTube channel and subscribe I'm Kevin Carlson I'm George Palmer I'm Gavin Ashton and as the script says you've been listening to Anglican Unscripted 484 it's us. It's got our names. We're so infamous. Notorious. Notorious. <laughs> <laughs>